She's like those old TV screens. I know. <laughs> I think there was a Twilight Zone episode that had something like that in the in the the whole way. Would, huh? Yeah, the person would talk to you. It was a scary. Well, it was scary to me. I watched it as a child. <laughs> I think Uni may be saying something, but we can't hear you, Uni. She's doing a Jackson Pollock invitation. <laughs> hey, I do have to split a little after 10. I've got a 10.30 appointment I've got to go to, so I'll have to bug out a little early. Well, so far, it's just the five of us. OK, maybe you could track. Uh, oh, it's 9.04. We should probably start. Paloma said she was going to join a few minutes or, or late. And Uni, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. But now, um, now I don't think that you can see me. Can you? No. No. Just your name. Yeah, so I'm trying to figure this one out. Either I can speak or I can see. So I'll just uh, up for the speaking uh, and hearing thing. Uh, <laughs> this is my cell phone. I'm trying to get my uh, laptop, but it's. Um, I have been some problem with it, so I'm going to continue on the on the um, phone, and then whenever the computer wants to work, then it'll, I'll transfer. Okay. And you can see us. Uh, I could see you before, but if I do that, then I cannot hear you. So I'd rather hear you than than see you. I I saw you already, so I know how beautiful people you are. <laughs> but I have some charts. <laughs> PowerPoint presentation that I'm going to be putting up in a minute, Uni. Okay, so I'm going to keep on trying my phone to see if it uh, it will uh, boot up. So I will keep on trying. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So can I start, honey? Yes, darling, I think you could. Yeah, I guess so. I thought more people would join in, but go ahead, go for it. Okay, but you know, basically the people that are here kind of know this stuff. <laughs> and my PowerPoint presentation isn't really pretty like yours, uh, Vinny. <laughs> uh, a, a man of very limited talents. One of them is, oh, that's gorgeous. It is not. I, Yes, it is. So did I like tell it. you that I'm the queen of PowerPoint? When I really did PowerPoint, you can ask your niece. I did animation and all that stuff. Because I used to oh, do really? presentations for JPL. So anyway, so what I wanted to talk about is, um, you know, after the power memo. It's, it's good that Bob started talking about dark money. Dick, can you do the sound thing? Because I'm getting reverb in my ear. Okay, so that's just between Dick and I. All right, so now I'm trying to do my screen changes, and that's not working. Oh, it is. Here we okay. Go. So agenda, we're going to talk about what is the ACLU, what's its purpose. We're going to go over the organizational structure and talk about why we volunteer. And then I want to talk a little bit about Jane um, McAlevey and her book, which I haven't completed, but I'm into it. And then I want to give a metaphor or two about my vision of where we are and, and what we can do in the future. So this might be helpful for Bob because Bob, you're relatively new to your engagement with this chapter. That's right. So the, the ACLU's motto is because freedom can't protect itself. Um, the predecessor was the National Civil Liberties Bureau. It was formed 100 years ago. And the headquarters is on 125 Broad Street in New York. As the affiliate rep to National, um, I go to the New York meeting a couple of times a year. The president is Susan Herman. In her role, she does not get paid. The executive director is Anthony Romero. 
in his role, I think his salary exceeds 500000 a year. Susan Romero, I mean, Susan Herman is not paid. However, she does get a paid assistant. Um, all of her travel is paid for. And um, if she needed a special office, which she does not, but if she needed an office, the ACLU would provide it for her office, computer, um, any of the, the things that help her to do her job, including a full-time assistant. The budget says here $133.4 million, but that was as of 2014. Now it's at about $310 million. Uh, the staff was at 300 in 2017. I think the staff attorneys are now at maybe 500. Can I ask a question? Sure. So uh, dividing out there with 1.2 million members, it looks like a, about $300 per member. So it clear, it's clear to me it's not all coming from dues. Can you tell us where else uh, the oh. ACLU is going? Oh. <laughs> yeah, so the ACLU has, first of all, it's one of the um, largest in terms of revenue nonprofit organizations in the country. Mm -hmm. It receives a substantial amount of revenue and support from donations, not memberships, not, mem not the monthly membership fees. It's the big donors that some will give over a million, million, tens of millions. They have a legacy program, so when people pass away, um, they can give whatever they're going to give. And there were many deep-pocketed individuals, especially in Hollywood, um, that are happy to be affiliated with and to contribute to the ACLU. So the mission and the vision of the ACLU is really very simple. It's dedicated to the preservation and enhancement of civil liberties, civil rights, and economic justice. Now one caveat here, the economic justice piece is just with the ACLU of Southern California. National ACLU, and I believe that maybe even all of the other states do not incorporate economic justice as one of the, the tenets of their uh, mission. But Why do you we, think that is, the difference? Well, it was never economic justice, this, and it wasn't civil rights. It started out as just civil liberties. Mm -hmm. And for, you know, for, the, for those that don't know, civil liberties are just the, the 10 uh, amendments, the first 10 amendments to the Constitution. Those are what our civil liberties, civil liberties are. But during the civil rights movement, um, the ACLU of Southern California had um, Ma Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King to come out. And if you go to the ACLU downtown, you'll see these beautiful black and white photographs of Dr. Martin Luther King on the wall in several, several places. And he's speaking to large crowds. Well, that was here in Los Angeles. Initially, the ACLU of Southern California did not want to um, have Dr. Martin Luther King because the ACLU in the 60s believed that the NAACP's role was to be an advocate and champion for civil rights, not the ACLU. Mm. And so it took a, a big fight. At the time, the ACLU president, I believe, was, honey, what was the, the gentleman who just passed away about three years ago? He's, he's a wonderful. Marvin Schachter. Marvin. Marvin Schachter. Does any, do any of you know who Marvin Schachter is? I know the name. He's in entertainment, no. right? No, no, there is a shack, to, no, but, but this is okay. not. Marvin um, was almost 100 years old when he passed away. He lived in Pasadena. He was a longtime activist. He was a president of the ACLU of Southern California at one point. He was a member of our chapter, local 
Pasadena Foothills chapter, extremely active. In fact, he was 100 years old. Dick and I went to a meeting across town somewhere, and we saw him driving down Colorado Boulevard. And his little car, he's, he's a small man, and he's 100, so he's like five foot two. He's down like this, and he's driving to his meeting. And he, I mean, he was vocal, he did marches, he did everything. And he died maybe two weeks after we saw him at that meeting. But he was one of the key people that maintained that the ACLU should include civil rights and economic justice as part of their mission. And he, it was he that made it possible for Dr. Martin Luther King to come to Southern California and to speak. And to this day, the ACLU of Southern California sort of brags that um, Martin Luther King came. He came after the riots in 19, uh, was it 67? 65? Yeah, sh shortly before, 65, 65. Shortly before uh, he was assassinated. So anyway, so those are the three tenets. And then the way that we operate or advance our mission is through litigation, lobbying, policy research and advocacy, community education and engagement. Now, I'm gonna show you a chart that kind of gives a breakdown of how <coughs> we divvy up our resources among these four areas. It's, it's not next. I just wanted to talk about the difference between uh, civil liberties and civil rights. I made this chart a long time ago um, in support of Constitution Day. So we know that civil liberties are the first 10 amendments of the Constitution. But an easy way to think of it is that the civil liberties place limitations on the power of government. And that's the only way that the Constitution actually could have been ratified by the 13 original colonies. They were fearful of a strong federal government, and so they needed some guarantees that the federal government would have limitations placed on it. So those are what the civil liberties are, the first 10 amendments. But civil rights, which were incorporated after the Civil War through the 14th Amendment, civil rights are what the government must provide. As opposed to limiting the government, civil rights um, offer a set of requirements to a certain subset of people. I'm one of those people. <laughs> so there are protected classes of people. And we see how effective that is. See how, work, how that works for George Floyd. But anyway, um, <laughs> that's the difference between civil rights and civil liberties. Civil rights did not come about until after the Civil War. And I just, I just threw this in, so if anybody wanted to look at the first 10 amendments, and then the bottom one is the 14th Amendment, which provides the equal protection of the laws. And so that means that each of the states now fall under the same rules of the federal government, because the first 10 amendments only apply to the federal government. Oh, here's Jim Nacella. Mr. Constitutional Day himself. <laughs> so am I saying this right, Jim? Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Another question. Yes. Well, back on that slide, can you go back, back up. up? Yeah, the, the first 10 amendments, I think, are only for citizens. And the 14th is for people, is that right? You know, that is not something that has been necessarily codified anywhere, but I've often <coughs> heard both Hector and Anthony Ramirez say that the ACLU believes that the um, civil liberties are also, um, that non-citizens are entitled to the protections, protections of civil liberties and civil rights, non-citizens. So the immigrants. Right. right. That's what I'm talking about. Yes. Even undocumented. I'd like to read an ACLU paper on that. Would you be able to provide me? Yeah, I, I can do a search and see if I can find some. But I, I know that I, Hector has, has said it and he's Thank probably you. written it. Thank you. 
So the ACLU is headquartered in, in uh, New York, uh, founded in 1920. It has two organizations, just like Southern California has two nonprofit organizations, a 501c4, a 501c3. This is sort of boring corporate law, but what it boils down to is we have one arm that takes donations and people get a tax write-off. But in exchange for them giving money and us being able to give them a tax write-off, we give up our right to lobby and to be partisan. So we can't be partisan or, or engage in any kind of lobbying or partisan type activities under the 501c3. The 501c4, on the other hand, can take donations, but they're not tax deductible. And, but we can lobby using those funds. But obviously, when people give to the ACLU, they generally give to the C3. So that's where these really deep pocket Hollywood type individuals, they want their tax write off. And so we can't lobby using those funds. How do they maintain the separation between the two separate entities? I mean, obviously for tax purposes, I can see why that's done, but how do they prevent um, commingling of funds? So they have a chart of accounts. Um, if you look at the budget, there are line items. And the line items are separated based on the activities. So activities that are C3 related are the kinds of activities like, um, oh, I would say that when we raise funds philanthropically and we have a big event, the monies that come out of that come out of C3 money. When we pay for litigation, C3 money. So we have a lot of attorneys, their salaries come out of C3 money and they charge two accounts that are allocated to the C3. For those that are engaged in lobbying, for like we have a Sacramento, Lobby Day in Sacramento, the cost, um, and the revenue that's used for that comes out of the C4 accounts. And when the staff is working on those activities, they're charging to the C4 accounts. Does, it, does that answer your question? Okay. So there are 54 affiliates. Um, every state has one affiliate. Washington DC also has one. Puerto Rico has one. And California has three. So for a total of um, 54. California is the only state with more than one affiliate. And the, and the membership, I say here, it's approximately 2 million because in the other chart, um, it was from 2000 and I think 2017 or 2014, but now we're up to about the year 2017 or 2014. But in 2020, we're up to about 2 million. So this is how the revenue is broken down. If you look at this chart on the left, the pie chart, uh, about 46% of the revenue from national is shared with the various um, affiliates across the country. So for example, some affiliates almost are completely dependent on getting that share from national like mississippi you can see that mississippi um needs the help but, but aside from that they don't really generate um enough revenue to support the kind of work that they need to do there in mississippi so the affiliate um kind of floats them we uh, California, we put in more, but we don't need to do as much. The legislative part of the pie is about 12%. Um, the legal, the litigation part is more than a quarter. 
And then public education, civil liberties policy formation is the, is the remainder. Does the affiliate uh, uh, break down to between legislative and legal and public education about the same as national? In a similar way, yes. And I don't know if I have a chart. I might have a chart in here for that. Uh -huh. But if you're really interested, Bob, I can um, get that yeah. information from when we have our um, bi-monthly meetings, Hector goes through the budget in excruciating detail. So there's no membership component to the budget? Yes, but I'm not showing it here. Let's see, grants and contributions, donated legal services. No, I'm not showing it here. It's clumped together in the top line, grants and contributions. Well, that's on the revenue side. The expenses, I'm to, the expenses would be, uh, there's no expenses for membership at recruitment or anything like that? Oh, no, no, we're not going down to that level of granularity in this chart. But in Hector's report, yes, it's, it's probably, I don't know, maybe 50 lines, 50 line items. Thank you. So the relationship to national. So Southern California is affiliated with national. The Pasadena Foothills chapter is under this umbrella of the Southern California of ACLU. All the revenue is shared um, between the Southern California affiliate and the ACLU. Each affiliate has a national board representative and I'm the one for Southern California. And we work collaboratively with national but there's a, there's a sort of a loose relationship in terms of our autonomy. We, like I said, our mission is slightly different because we incorporate economic justice and national does not. We can maintain our autonomy, although we try to present a unified face to the outside world because the outside world they just see the ACLU as one ACLU. In their minds, they don't understand that each state is separate and autonomous from national. So um, let's talk about Southern California. So in Southern California, we have the Southern California affiliate, we have the Northern California affiliate, and then we have San Diego. So those are the three affiliates in California. And recently, as recently as I'm going to say a year and a half ago, we joined forces with the three affiliates. And now we jointly fund something that we're calling um, ACLU California. So it's not really an affiliate. So I say California has like three and a half affiliates now, but all three of us have joined forces. And by joining forces, our budget in California is 22 to 25 million. We have about 275,000 members, more than 200 staff members, including attorneys. And then, of course, opportunities for collaboration and just a lot more power. In the state, the state of California is the elephant of the ACLU. This is our org chart for Southern California. At the top is the executive director, and that's Hector Viagra. The area all the way on the left, the activists and engagement development, the manager for that is, um, what's her name, Dick? Um, I'm um, losing her name. That's is okay. it Ga Gabrielle? No, Gabrielle. Yeah, okay. Gabby is chapters and clubs. It's Gabby's boss. I'm, I'm, I'm. Elvia. Elvia. I'm sorry, I'm messing with my Oh, are you. Did Jennifer? You muted me. You muted me? Did you mute me? No. No, you now, he muted himself. And uh, there's no more echo. You sound much better now. Yes. What? Perfect. Oh. Oh, no. Night. You, you hear me better. Yes, we hear you much better. Oh, great. Okay. 
involved and I won't wear these headphones. I thought the headphones improved my sound. All right, so the, um, the activist and engagement development is managed by Elvia Mesa and the chapters and clubs is, um, is Gabby. People power is a piece of software, but there's, there is a, a team there, but that little sliver, the activist engagement and development part is where the chapters fall under the chapters and the clubs. The rest of the chart, which you can see, is the basic staff, the, the hundreds of staff at the ACLU and attorneys. Now the board, our role here is really disconnected from the staff. The power that we have is the power to set policy, the power to hire or fire an executive director. We do the the um, executive committee does Hector's um, annual review, his performance review, but we really don't really engage with the rest of the ACLU staff, except to work on collaborative efforts. But we don't do their performance evaluations or make any determination about how much their salaries will be or any of that stuff. All of that is Hector's responsibility. We review his performance in that regard, but we don't um, try to get involved in how he handles his staff. Question about this chart. What yeah. about, what it says publications. What are, are there any publications? I haven't seen any publications coming my way. Yeah, so most of that is probably um, online publications. The ACLU of Southern California does have a website did, okay. did you know? And so on the website, there will be articles, there are videos. They, they kind of keep it up to date a little bit. We used to have a page there. I haven't looked at it in quite some time. I don't know if the Pasadena Foothills chapter, but our picture was up there. Each chapter had a page, but like I said, I don't know if we still have that. No, you still have that because every now and then when somebody updates it, I get an email telling me that happened. Okay. Okay, thank you, Ed. That answers. So the ACLU of Southern California was founded in 1923. So remember, the, uh, the overall national was founded in 1920. The Southern California affiliate was founded in 1923. It was the first of all the affiliates, because before everything was happening in New York City. And it was founded as a result of some work that Upton Sinclair and friends were involved in. They got arrested for doing of all, what were they doing? They were reading the constitution in support of striking longshoremen. Isn't that crazy? They were arrested for that. It's unbelievable to me. The constitution is a subversive document, please. Subversive. <laughs> <laughs> the constitution, yeah. The officers warned, cut out that constitution stuff. <laughs> That's literally what they said. Cut out that constitution stuff. So, like I said, we're like, National, we also are comprised of a 501c3 and a 501c4. The 501c4 is the union, and that's the side that we're all on. The 501c3 is the foundation. The foundation has its meetings, like in Culver City. In order to be a member of the foundation, you have to pay $10,000 a year. Jesus. Mm -hmm. And the foundation actually brings in the most money. Part of their responsibilities as individual board members of the foundation is they need to bring in more money. They're the money people. Where the active, the union side is the activist people, the foundation side is the money people. Um, they say both are nonpartisan, and yes, we are both nonpartisan, except that the 501c4 can lobby for issues, but not for candidates. We can't, we can't lobby for candidates, but we can lobby for issues. Okay. And I think I've said this. Oh, the, the union has 107,000 members. The foundation doesn't have members. So when the membership and when people pay their membership, it goes to the union, the 501c4. And you'll know like when you pay your membership, that's not tax deductible. It's membership of a 501c4 organization. So that's how the 501c4 is funded, but the 501c3 is funded by major um, contributions and the $10,000 for every 
foundation board member. So currently, the way that the organization and the engagement policy works is you have engaged individuals, people that are already members of the ACLU, working inside of an organizational structure, which I showed you the org structure. We have the chapters, the clubs, and we have people power. And then we act when we have the political opportunity to do so. So we have Lobby Day in Sacramento. We have a team that's headed up by Clarissa Wu, er, Hermesio, who is engaged in research and policy development. She stays plugged in with Sacramento. When we have the chance to get involved into something that's going to help to shape legislation, she works on that. She'll pull in us, she'll call us, and we, this is what we call our um, engagement policy. And it's kind of the extent to which the average volunteer is involved. This is essentially a staff-centered organization that is engaged in litigation, for the most part, lobbying, and some community education and some community engagement. And it's taken me a long time to really understand what this is about, because it was never laid out to me this way. But I've been involved long enough that I can say, and I've been involved at every level, chapter, Southern Cali affiliate, national, just a person paying my dues, just a person donating. I understand now this organization better than I ever have. And I wish that I had the same understanding now that I have now. I wish I had it 10 years ago. And so there, are, there are no members of the chapter? I didn't, put, I didn't include chapter in this presentation. We're the chapter. Um, yeah, that's so what I, I thought. Should, yes, yes. Let, let, me, let me talk about that. That's a good point, Bob, because I could have included a chart there. So when people, let's say that my neighbor right next door to me has no idea that I'm involved in the ACLU, and he sends a check to the national. When he does that, national takes half the check, and the other half is sent to the ACLU of Southern California based on my neighbor's address. They know where the money came from. Then the ACLU of Southern California now has a list of everybody by zip code. But the ACLU of Southern California doesn't necessarily tell the chapters they have this information. These people are considered at-large members. They're not considered chapter members. The chapter then can go to the ACLU of Southern California, can talk to Gabby and say, hey, um, we'd like a, a list of the zip codes, certain zip codes. And we've gotten those in the past. You know, let, let me see what's happening in 91101 or, you know, or 91305. Our Southern California zip codes, we can get a list of all the zip codes and the people who are members of the ACLU in those zip codes. We used to send a mailing to them when we voted on um, in November for chapter president or for, I don't think we're doing that right now, but we do have access to that information, Bob. All so right, that's, thank you. that's that one list, but we do this chapter because we're so active and because we've had so many forums, we've collected our own, we have our own database. And in our own database, how many people do we have, Vic? We have 2,500 people, some of which have paid the ACLU dues, some of which haven't, but they've all been to forums and they're all engaged in the kinds of work that ACLU type people would be interested in. So we have our own list that we use all the time. Okay, so why did I join? So I joined the ACLU because I'm not happy with what I see happening in my community because I'm over 60 years old and because I have watched right before my eyes this country just spiraling downward. I cannot believe 30 years ago, I could walk downtown Los Angeles or 35 years ago, I could walk downtown Los Angeles and not see a single homeless person, not one. And now I have to step over people. It's unbelievable. So the reason that I wanted to join the ACLU is because I wanted to see change. 
So I became a member uh, initially of the chapter and then the affiliate board. I thought it was an opportunity to, to make change, to get with people <laughs> of, of like mind. You know, same reason that you guys. Any, anybody here have any reason that they joined the ACLU, which was strictly to make friends, um, have a sandwich every two months and, and drink coffee with them? <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting you say that because I joined the ACLU when I was in college in 1956. So that was before I was born. Yeah, and also at that time, ACLU, as you tell me, was strictly a civil liberties organization. That's right. That's all it was. And it was because those civil liberties were being abridged and, and my college had a, had a long history of being a leftist kind of college. And, and I stayed active uh, while I was teaching for a while. And then other things came on and, and I was so busy doing so many things I dropped out. And then I rejoined when I came back in Pasadena and now I find it to be a much more activist organization than it was uh, back in 56. Yes, um, you know, it, so, it has sort of ebbed and flowed. When it started in Southern California, you know, the story about Upton, Upton Sinclair and being down at, um, they were in San Pedro reading the, they had the nerve to be reading the constitution yeah. out loud. Well, back then it was an activist. It started out as an activist organization. And in fact, they didn't even have any attorneys in, initially. So, so it took a while for the ACLU to change. When Ramona Ripston came on, that's when the ACLU as it exists today began to really change. She started to um, put a lot more energy into involving the Hollywood community big time fundraisers, focusing more on litigation, hiring more and more attorneys. And then the ACLU became more of a litigation organization as opposed to an activist organization. But Ramona was uh, on board, I, maybe 35 years she was the executive director. It, it, could have been a, it could have been 35 years, it could have been longer, maybe 40 years. Hector came on board uh, about uh, seven years ago when Ramona left. You know, Ramona, um, she was a dynamo. And sadly, um, you know, she just passed away recently, but she really, um, she went downhill fast. I think she had Alzheimer's. But the organization took on a different, um, a different flavor under Hector's uh, leadership. And Hector really did want to have it be more of a community engagement kind of organization. So, but before that, um, before that, Rona, Ramona was really just interested in litigation and getting Hollywood involved, getting the money that it took to do the lit, to, to do the litigation. So, so that was my take. Um, and if anybody wants to say anything, like, oh, maybe Marla wants to say something. I don't know what. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you here and, and what is your uh, feeling about the organization? I am muted. I was muted. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, you want me to say? Yeah. I if think, you want. first of all, it's two complete. Uh, to me, the Pasadena Foothills chapter is a completely different thing from ACLU SoCal, at least in, in my limited experience. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how do I, oh, I don't know how to get this to a different screen, but. I mean, the, the, the ACLU SoCal board, I've been on it since, what, December? Yeah. I, I, I still don't know why. I mean, I don't, I, I don't feel like they want, I mean, it's, it's, I've been to several meetings, you know, some in person before we were under the stay-at-home orders. Um, but it's gotten worse even after the stay-at-home orders. We sit there on phone calls for hours at a time, literally muted. They so clearly don't want to hear from us, and I'm still trying to figure out, it seems like at this point that the purpose of the board is to um, put uh, uh, bodies with pulses on the board to fulfill a mandate in the bylaws. Um, they just, I, I thought that I was joining the board because I thought that there would be some uh, input 
or some interest in what the board members have to say, but instead I find myself on these marathon calls listening to what really is almost the equivalent of a, of a school kid's book report about what they've done. And, you know, staff reports on the things they've done. The staff reports are almost always prefaced with about 10 minutes of praise for the dear leader. You know, the last one last week was just on and on and on with all these accolades and congratulations. And I'm sitting there thinking, my God, why? she's a paid staffer doing her job. I mean, I get it. Yes, say you did a good job, but 10 minutes of just nonstop blathering and and I mean I'm actually stunned because I think that there's a lot of talent on that board and I'm still trying to figure out why there is even a qualification or selection process when they don't want to hear from us and I I mean I I actually just signed up the other day um, to try to get you know to try to volunteer with the innocence project to actually do something. I want to do something. I didn't sign up to be on constant calls that are just blah, 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 and not do anything. I want a task. I want to be part of something and not be sort of sitting on the sideline as a silent cheerleader. You know, it's really, I just think, you know, that the ACLU SoCal does a lot of great work, but I can't help but think how much more they could do if they actually involved board members and other people. And I see this kind of tension a lot between like, the parallel that comes to mind is the tension between animal control employees and volunteers. There's like mm. this wall. The employees absolutely do not want the volunteers there at all. Because right. the volunteers are there for good reasons, for the right reasons. They love the animals and they love what they're doing. Yeah. The staff, absolutely, they do. They want to do what they want to do, and they don't want questions. They don't want any inside out outside influence. They just want to do what they want to do and leave them alone. Right. And and that's the impression I get with the ACLU SoCal staff versus the board. It shouldn't be versus. It should be how do we leverage the talent we have on this board and put it to good use instead of sitting there on endless phone calls listening to book reports i mean that's really kind of and i know I'm, that may sound jaded but i i'm at the point where i'm just thinking maybe i should just walk away because it's so futile and useless and a waste of time honestly unless they want to kind of do something just um, I'm hoping that the remainder of my slides will convince you to not walk away. But I do want to say, Marla, that everything that you've just said, that's exactly how I have felt. And I was saying before you, you uh, tapped into the call mm -hmm. that I wish that I had done this presentation when I first joined the ACLU, because I then would have had a better understanding about what is the ACLU about. And I wouldn't be feeling the sense of frustration that you mm -hmm. just expressed mm -hmm. because i felt that way for a very long time mm -hmm. but there really is a role for the aclu oh i'm not questioning the role for the aclu because i think the aclu does phenomenal work and i love the aclu pasadena foothills chapter because we do things we don't sit and yammer and on and on and on and and blow smoke up each other's orifices telling each other how great we are and you know for 20 minutes at a time we actually we take a decision we do something but I don't see that with, with the, the SoCal board. It's always after the fact, they're telling us what they did and um, there's no role for the board to be involved. And it's very clear to me at least that the staff doesn't want that involvement. In fact, a couple months ago, there was a, uh, on one of the board calls, there was a, a, a very direct message that uh, board members are never to contact staff to make any suggestions about any other campaigns. And I thought, okay. All right, then, okay. I mean, I get that they don't want all the board members telling the, the staff what to do, that, that's understandable, but they don't seem to want any input at all. And there, there, there is a way to have input. Deacus is gonna say something like that. Okay. Yeah, I came over here because I, I'd get reverb if I tried to talk on my phone, uh, <laughs> on my computer. So, so what I wanted to say is that there's been a lot of people that have shared the sentiments that both Sharon and, and Marla have said, and a fair number of board members have got on and have walked away because yeah. there, is, there is a contingent of board members who are perfectly happy 
to to burnish their resumes yes. and to show up and to uh, have coffee every other month. But yeah. so uh, so how how have we fought with that and why why are Sharon and I on for a dozen years? Well, partly it is uh, we partly it is. Uh, we enjoyed rubbing elbows with those folks and then doing our work through Pasadena Foothills. Yeah. And, and then we, and then part of the work through Pasadena Foothills is we have worked at getting staff members to partner with us. And we've had some success over the years at, at a fair amount of effort, particularly Miguel Cruz and Jess Ferris mm -hmm. have partnered with us. The other thing is we headed up on the union board for four or five years, a criminal justice outreach committee to try to get volunteers involved in the work the staff was doing. And I would say essentially that came to not much. We are currently in an effort to do the same thing with the economic justice committee. We have 15, 18, 20 board members who are most interested in actually doing things. Mm -hmm. uh, we are wrestling with staff to let us do it. It's not clear to me that we will succeed, but we will give it this effort, and then we sh we uh, stand for re-election to the union board in in December, and it's up in the air whether I will run again. I I my resume is looking fine for a retired guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and and, and I'm self-employed. I I'm you know I'm not I kind of and I know this is terrible, but I kind of call some people board whores. They're people who just want to be on boards. <laughs> because they want to tell people they're on boards. That is not remotely interesting to me. I'm self-employed. I don't need to pad my resume. I don't care about that stuff. I really don't. And 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 so I, I'm not interested in, in, you know, just saying I'm on the board of the ACLU SoCal. I mean, it, I don't. Yeah. yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm with you, Marla. I understand and I'm, I'm, I cannot emphasize enough <laughs> how long I had felt the same way that you felt. But there's, there's a couple of things that I, I did get involved in, which I'm glad I did, and I believe it is shaping the flow. It's like turning the, the Titanic, but it is shaping the age. I mean, Dick and I insisted that we have Facebook presence. You know, when we first came on, they would not let us have a Facebook. We couldn't have Twitter. We couldn't um, videotape anything, any, even though we did anyway. We just I just kept saying, well, we're just going to just do what we're going to do anyway, and eventually things will change. And they are changing, but it's so slow. Yeah. So, so let me uh, go on. So, yeah. So the, the pros and cons. Okay. So I network with, with, oh, I have met some really great people that I'm working with in other stuff still mm -hmm. to push the progressive agenda. Had I not been part of the board, I would not have met these people. <laughs> Um, so I'm building a community within the board, across gender, across race, which is my thing. My thing yeah. is we have got to establish these bridges. And mm -hmm. there are people that I've come into contact as a result of being affiliated with the ACLU that I would never have crossed paths with. So it's serving in that way. And, and the purpose is not to just be friends. I don't want to just be mm -hmm. friends. Mm -hmm. I'm really a serious introvert, give me a thousand books, a few bottles of wine, <laughs> put me in a room, I'm good. Yeah, I'm me good. too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't know the social interaction, but I love you guys. But you know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know. Hey, hey Sharon, <laughs> I've got to call BS on that one. What? I like books, I like wine, I have a six foot bong. But I've watched you in action, and you are a mover and a shaker and a mixer extraordinaire. So sorry, I gotta call BS on that one. Yeah, you, I told, you, know what, though, you may I, prefer it, but you do that other job very well. I get it too, though, because I'm I'm by nature I'm an introvert. I really am. I am perfectly happy to stay home. This whole self, you know, this whole stay at home order. I'm like, okay, I'm cool. Yeah. yeah. I'm good. Oh, me too. I'm a, a shrinking <laughs> violent. I never want to share my opinion. I, we know that. I find it difficult to mix with people. <laughs> <laughs> Bulls, bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> my favorite sound is the sound of my own voice. <laughs> well, what I've learned, guys, <laughs> is that the board's mission is not compatible with organizing. Mm -hmm. no, it's not. I don't the board is not about organizing. It states it in its mission. 
The mission of the board is to establish policy mm -hmm. to review Hector's Hector's performance. Oh, yay. Re that's really it. To establish <laughs> policy, policy that's consistent with civil liberty, civil rights, and economic justice. The policy established by the board is ACLU policy mm -hmm. as well as helping to shape legislation mm -hmm. and then to lobby people in Sacramento. We collaborate with other organizations, all kinds of organizations. Um, I don't know the, the um, I, I can't think of any organizations right now, but we Sharon, do, them. Yeah. do they, do they not think that's organizing? Is that why? <laughs> No, no, I say it's not compatible with organizing because I've gotten my definition of what organizing is based on Jane McAlevey. And so I got a couple uh, of slides where I want to talk about. Now, what is my understanding? Okay, so after years of involvement, no meaningful change, I needed to understand what was wrong. And so this is where Jane McAlevey came in. So I, like Vince, Vince and I have read a lot of the same books. We both see, and Bob, we all see what's happening in this country. Why is it that the progressive movement is so woefully off track, so woefully disempowered? The book, No Shortcuts, helped me to understand a couple of basic things. I highly encourage you, if you do not read the book, go to YouTube. She's got a ton of, of, of interviews out there on YouTube. Spend an hour with Jane. You'll get it. Her name is Jane McAlevey. Go to YouTube, search that name. I'll send you these charts if you guys want to see it. And just watch her for an hour, and you will understand what it is that we're doing wrong. Mm. I'll say this. My 23 years working at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory Help me to understand what it takes to get something significant done. When you have a mission that is, anyone would look at this mission, what we're trying to achieve and say, that is impossible. You cannot do that. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, you can. First, you have to target what it is you're going to do. That's the number one thing. Say what it is you're going to do. Then pull together a bunch of people that are all in agreement. This is the thing we're going to do. This is when we're going to do it. We're going to put a spacecraft in orbit around Mars, and we intend to launch it in three years. We're going to do it for $300 million. The rest we'll figure out. We got a year to do the development. You see, you've got to have a clearly defined target, people that are all on the same page, wanting to do this thing, whatever the thing is. And then you have to have a schedule and a budget and you will get something done. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't really do that at the ACLU. We're just kind of continually funding something sort of nebulous, but not something specific. So some of the stuff that I learned from Jane, oh, here's a, her YouTube, just, just to remind you that you can go and find tons, tons of stuff. I love, I just love this woman. She's studied, she's, she has a PhD. She has a PhD in actual living it before she, she was, a, like I was a late um, law student. She was a late PhD student. She went like in their fifties. So, so she lived the life before she actually became a PhD, although she had undergrad. So she discovered that there are four major categories of making significant changes and producing re results. It's, you can get involved in charity, advocacy, mobilizing, and organizing. And she says that, you know, these three things, these four things look like each other, but really three of these things are similar and the fourth one is not the same. Organizing is not mobilizing. It is not advocacy. It is not charity. Charity, advocacy, and mobilizing is what the ACLU does. In its community engagement, it mobilizes people. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the difference between mobilizing and organizing. Mm. Can, I, but, can I say something? Yes. What charity. What does charity uh, is uh, of ACLU? What does charity? When people, when people just give money, oh. you know, there, there are people that make million dollar donations. 
they make a, cha a charitable donation to the to the oh, ACLU. I thought that you're saying that ACLU does charity work. No, the ACLU uh, the provides a vehicle. Money. Yes, correct. So the people that get involved with the ACLU, they either get involved at several different levels mm -hmm. as charity, or they can volunteer advocating, or they can volunteer like through people power and be mobilized to take action. But they are not ever, ever organizing. Mm -hmm. And if you go in thinking that you're gonna be organizing, mm -hmm. like Marla and like me, you're gonna be disappointed because that's not what they do. Mm -hmm. And they never, and. Although they say they do it, if they listen to Jane, they'll know they're not doing it. Okay, so what is organizing? So Mac Levy says charity. It's the least transformative of those four categories. People can give a check, never do anything else. Martin Luther King Jr. said, we'd need less charity if we had more justice. Mm -hmm. Charity has its place it's okay in a pinch when there is an urgent need for charity it's okay to go downtown and, and give some money to la can who's housing the homeless you know people who are houseless there's a need for that mm -hmm. but that's not the solution you know that's just a band-aid we got to get beyond that so that's what charity is it's okay in a pinch it certainly is not a bad thing but keep in mind a lot of these bad acting corporations have a philanthropic arm. They do charity. So charity doesn't necessarily make you good. Now, the next level of engagement, advocacy. So advocacy is something that is done on behalf of other people. This is according to Jane, and like, I'm so seeing it. So all oh, those poor people, let me help those poor people. We can write a check, it's staff driven. The staff will do research, they shape policy with the help of the volunteers to help them to get this lit litigation or this legislation passed. Volunteers will go up to Sacramento, volunteers will go to an ACLU event. We can make some gains, but we will not have truly transformative change. The next level is mobilizing. And she says, this is the one area that is most often confused with organizing. We rely on the staff to engage membership. Membership are people who are already on the same page with the ACLU. They've already said, hey, I'm a like-minded person. We engage those people and we mobilize. We use people power. We have the staff need something done. They contact people power, they pull together a thousand people and they'll go to um, San Bernardino and help to do voter registration or something. That's mobilizing, that is not organizing. So it's often confused with organizing. It uses a staff centric model. It involves people who are already signed up, already part of the organization. They get involved with protests and flyers. She said there's endless turnout of largely the same people over and over and over again. And when they get exhausted, they just get new people, but nothing has been transformed because it's tops down and the intention really is not to truly upset the apple cart. The intention is not to significantly change the status quo. But organizing differs. It vests and rests in ordinary people, not professionals. It is a mission with a target. You name what it is you're trying to change and you're set and focused on accomplishing that target. It's bottoms up oriented. It's about changing okay. hearts and minds of people who are not already on the same page with you. It gets people who are not part of the choir and deepens and strengthens the movement. You ultimately join forces to mount a campaign to reach the target, whatever that target is. In Jane McAlevey's case, she talks a lot about labor unions, but you can use these same techniques with uh, political um, transformations. 
You can use these same techniques on anything that you need a group to do, where you, it looks like you have a bunch of disparate people, people who have different interests, they belong to different demographics, they belong, you can find a thing, and we certainly can find it in this country, where we can all come together and just work on that thing. So, okay, I put this here to remind me of the story of the new neighbors. This is to give you a sense of what I have seen. This story was told to me by um, a gentleman at a group, oh, I know, it was ICUJP. Does anybody know ICUJP? It's an interfaith. Uh, Steve Rohde uh, was, I think Steve Rohde was the president of ICUJP. Yes. Yeah, sure. <laughs> anyway, the, the gentleman says that when he, he, he's, he was probably about 70 years old, this man who was talking, maybe 75, and he lived somewhere in um, Ohio. And when he was a young man, um, uh, actually a child, his parents lived in a suburb in Ho Ohio. And this is a white man speaking. And he says a black family moved into their neighborhood. And uh, the whole neighborhood was upset about it. He said some really awful people, when the, when the f husband and wife went to work, someone took a water hose, opened up the window of their home, and oh. turned, on, turned on the water full force. And when he was telling this story, I don't know why, it has always stuck with me because it, it for me, it provided a vision of what's happening with us right now. When the people came home, they, everybody was, you know, the family, the husband, the mom, the dad, the kids, the uncle, they're trying to clean up this. They, initially, they didn't know where the water was coming from. They got the towels and the buckets and the mops and, and they're doing all this to clean up the mess, but they're not seeing the source of the problem and it's still coming in and so what i say where we are with the aclu this is the aclu this is what we're doing this needs to be done we need to take care of these urgent situations but we can't maintain this position because it continues to get worse so we need to get that hose out of the window and that is not going to be done by the ACLU. But we still need to support these fingers in the dike until we do the work that really needs to be done. So that's the end of my presentation. And I hope that gives you guys a, a better sense of where we stand with this organization. It is essential. I'm sorry, who was that? Who's, who's that? Is this, oh, I know, Michelle, your phone. I know, Michelle, you go in as your phone and your computer. Is that right? Just nod, Michelle, because we can see you. Okay. <laughs> so you guys get that? Does that make sense? Yeah, is there a discussion now? Yeah. Okay. Well, um, as a person who was a a professional organizer uh, for part of my life. I have some, uh, I have a lot of agreement about uh, how you characterize ACLU and I've been disappointed for years that they, A, uh, did not understand what organizing was and would not hire uh, real organizers or commit to doing the organizing at the grassroots. <clears throat> um, but I, I do not, uh, uh, well, in, in organizing the grassroots, you need professionally trained, experienced organizers. They're not just going to come together and be effective on their own. Now you uh, allude to union movements. The people in the union movements have some professional training and experience. Yeah. Yeah, don't, mis don't misunderstand me, Chris. Jane McAlevey is a professional organizer. Okay. So well, no, I think that ought to be. I think that ought to be included then in the presentation. Yes. Of what okay. You need because it's not going to happen without. I don't think. No, you're right. You're right. No, she. No, what I meant by professionals, I meant that the staff at the ACLU does not have professional organizers. That's correct. That's correct. And 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 it's not their intent actually to organize. Their intent is to mobilize. Right. And we need to we need to know that because you know you can flounder there for years and I agree. And, and not know that that's what that's about what it's about right I agree 
Okay, that's my two cents. Who else has stuff to say? <laughs> As it was, have, uh, it's interesting. I'll look her up. I've never heard of her. Are, is, are people familiar with uh, Marshall Gans? Yes. At all? Yeah. Yes, and, he, and Jane has had training with Marshall Gans. Okay, there you go. He's, uh, yeah, he's a key guy in the United States on that, on grassroots organizing. Bob. Yeah, let me make uh, uh, some comments about this. It's a fascinating conversation. Yeah. So the union movement was was very big in, in the ACLU of my youth. Um, Pete Seeger and all the old union songs and so forth. And organizing was kind of an important part of our history when we're, when we're back in, in the 50s and, and looking at things. And... About the time I retired and got back to doing a lot of time reading, I read a book about the labor movement in the U.S. And the, the problem was that the union leaders turned into uh, managers and not organizers. They would, they would go and handle, run contracts, but they weren't going out. And in particular, they weren't working their buns off to try to get new members. And so... One of the things that's happened is uh, the dark money and all of that, and, and just corporations generally have destroyed the union movement in the U.S. Yeah. Right. Uh, and Agreed. it's a really scary thing. And the one... Yeah, I'm still going. The, the, the one uh, bright light here that I read about, again, was SEIU, which had done some terrific organizing, and in particular, terrific organizing right here in L.A., now, where am I going to put all that? We right now have in excess of 40 million unemployed persons in the United States. Right this minute today. Those people are not all going to be able to go back to work when somebody opens up a little bit. There's still going to be a zillion unemployed people. Those people are right for organizing. If, if the United States of America does not use this opportunity to get those people together working for a better future, then shame on us. Just shame on us. We have to do that. That's right. So it's sort of like Naomi, the opposite of Naomi Klein's shock doctrine, where she talks about how deep pocketed corporations take advantage of these crises. Well, we can take advantage of this crisis too. So even though there is, you know, like Bob, you were saying, dark money, it kind of looks like, oh my gosh, how can we, how can we come up against this? Well, we can come up against this because what we're seeing is fissures in the structure of our society. We can come up through those fissures. So I have my hand up. Um, I have the advantage of very briefly being on the ACLU staff. I stepped in and, and organized chapters uh, while Elvia Mesa went on maternity leave a couple of years ago. And I'd like to say that I think that the ACLU staff downtown does have some professional organizers or people who are working at becoming professional organizers. Not as many as they think they have, but there are some fairly effective ones. I would say Eve Garo in Orange County, organizing around uh, homelessness issues and getting legislation changed. I think she's quite effective. Um, my gripe is that they do not see us, deeply experienced people, as, as partners in the organizing. They see us as tools to mobilize. But see, they want us to carry signs. My hand's still up. Good. They <laughs> see us carrying signs and, and showing up and wearing t-shirts, uh, but they don't, it's, it's, it's a struggle to get them to partner uh, in the formulation of plans and actually mobilizing other people. And that's my gripe. I mean, some of us have done that kind of stuff in different venues. I used to work for a nonprofit organization. I was in a different lifetime. I was Clarissa Wu Hermosillo, dealing with you volunteers. But there were effective ways to get volunteers in the tent with you and use their expertise. And that's what I think the affiliate staff is missing. So I just wanted to make it clear, perhaps my presentation did not make this clear. The distinction that Jane McAlevey makes between mobilizing and organizing is just what you just said. You do not, you're not staff centered if you're really about organizing. You don't have staff calling the shots. Organizing is changing the hearts and minds of people who are not already in the choir. It's bottoms up. 
and the ACLU, maybe they have some people that understand this, but that's not what they do. That's just not part of their mission or their charter. Well, I would ask, add the addendum that part of organizing is mobilizing others. It's getting other people to, to give charitable donations. And, and that's where they stand. I mean, they're organizing within their tent and they're trying to mobilize us outside the tent. They're not letting us in the tent, which has the effect of driving us away. Well, my question is, what do you suggest, Sharon, that we do within the strictures of uh, ACLU, or should we leave it? Well, I think that having made this presentation to you, hopefully you being more clear about what the ACLU is and what it isn't, you have to make a determination based on your own personal preferences, your own personal personality. I am staying because I think that we need these fingers in the dike. But others, if they choose to leave and take their energy and, uh, and use it somewhere else, is perfectly understandable. So, so my point of view, I had my hand up, was that what we do, what we attempt to do at the Pasadena Foothills chapter is pointing toward organizing, especially the work that maybe Michelle and Chris do mm -hmm. in Pasadena and then they lead and others of us participate. I think that's on, on the edge of organizing and that's a thing that I think we should refocus on rather than trying to change the affiliate. Sharon and I are trying to change the affiliate a bit through the Economic Justice Committee and I'm not clear that that's going to ever allow us to actually do any yeah. accomplish any goals, but that's an effort that we're making. Yeah. But I, I, I also I, want to say that, uh, I'm sorry, Chris, just let me just say quickly that the ACLU as a whole, as a, a national body, or all, all the states, it does some awesome stuff. I mean, it sued Donald Trump hundreds of times. The ACLU of New Mexico was able to get rid of capital punishment. I mean, there are some big things the ACLU does, and I want them to continue to do. I just don't, I just want to have a clear understanding of my role in it. Okay, mm -hmm. I agree with you and I, I will not leave the ACLU. I think it's valuable. I think we need it and the organizing needs it. I mean, it's backup. So, and it takes, you know, it, it takes a lot of assertive, aggressive measures that help and make a difference. Yeah. So I, I, uh, I just was curious as to what you were suggesting we do. I mean, I, I think the ACLU as a whole does great work, and I think that ACLU SoCal does really good work too, but I just, like I said, I can't help but wonder how much more ACLU SoCal could do if they did organize and if they did um, just involve the, the, the talents of so many of the board members. I mean, there's, you know, God knows how many hundreds of years of experience on that board, and we just sit there silenced and and... I mean, I don't know, would it be the worst thing in the world if I sent a detailed email to John, to the, to the, I guess he's the chairman of the board, and explained how I feel? I don't know that it'll make any difference, but I don't feel like walking away from the board without saying anything does them any favors either. No, I think that it would, do a, it would be a good idea to share your sentiments. I think everybody really should share those sentiments. Yeah. And my goal with this chapter Mm -hmm. is to work as organizers, mm -hmm. to understand organizing, and ho hopefully to expand this chapter and to employ some of the techniques that Jane McAlevey discusses. Mm -hmm. I, but that's going to take time and learning and ed educating ourselves and educating me. Well, when I'm talking about the board, I'm talking about the, the SoCal board, because to me, the Pasadena Foothills board is night and day different from the ACLU SoCal. I thought that I was going into a more active group like, like ACLU, uh, you know, Pasadena Foothills, but, but, the, but the, it's not, not the no. SoCal board. It's a, such a different animal and not really as far as I can see for any good reason other than kind of an unspoken tension between the staff and, you know, what they all, I, I almost get the impression that they see the, the, the board as kind of the enemy, as sort of a us versus them. And it just, <laughs> it's staff driven, sure. I, I would say though, that um, one of the, the benefits of working with ACLU in organizing is um, 
that we can, in some instances, have access to their attorneys on an ongoing basis. For example, Mo uh, Mohammed um, is working with both the surveillance task force as well as CCOP, which is focused on police reform here. And uh, he's very valuable and very helpful. They may continue, and they give money. I think he's got something like, I don't know, a $5,000 budget or something like that to help us if we need it. But if, um, if there are other uh, issues that align with ACLU's issues, uh, where they're getting significant um, response from local communities uh, in support of what the ACLU is believing in also, that may be, you may be able to get uh, direct help and direct professional legal expertise and help and backup. Um, I think, for example, the work that Michelle does with the Tenants Union, which is doing a lot of grassroots organizing as I understand it, um, I don't think you have the ACIU, you know, working with you, but that's something that you could, that seems reasonable at some point. Yeah. Uh, how are we doing the recognition? Are we raising hands and somebody's recognizing us or, and who's the person recognizing? Sharon? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to add that we've had uh, a lot of really talented organizers and union representatives who have come on the board and then left. And I don't think that the rest of the affiliate board really appreciates why they don't have those people among them any longer. Uh, one of the things that we're doing with the uh, economic justice uh, uh, committee on the affiliate level is starting a round of forums. And I think that perhaps what we could do is use one of those forums to show just how important and necessary it is for uh, there to be organizing, grassroots organizing of the kind that we're talking about uh, around economic justice issues. because. They, you know, unless people are organized, they don't know how to use the, the legal services that are so awesome in the ACLU. But, you know, as we roll out again, <laughs> the rent control stuff, we are now, we now have access to the First Amendment lawyers. And mm -hmm. we know how to, uh, we know what works and doesn't work in terms of what the law allows for uh, grassroots organizing and getting into certain of the buildings. And all that's important. Uh, if the affiliate wants to just stick to doing the legal work, okay, as support for uh, the, uh, the organizing, then that's fine. Well, it's not wonderful, but it, it's okay. Mm -hmm. if, if, however, they want to continue to say, that they're organizing, they really need to be talking to people they respect as organizers to show them that on the board level that the staff is not equipped at this point to do the kind of organizing that really needs to be done, especially for me, especially on the economic justice issues. Mm -hmm. How do we raise our hands? I have my hand raised. Oh, you have to be on view. Okay. Okay. So, so Chris, no, Chris, we can hear you. So, Chris, why don't you go next, and then Paloma, and then Marla. Okay. Um, so it seems to me like uh, what might be useful is to, in some way, be able to educate the board with McAlevey's uh, uh, talk, what you just showed to us, and what you've explained to us, and what you could illustrate by what's going on with us, for example. Um, and maybe you want to start with the Economic Justice Committee of the board, because they're board members, aren't they? Most of them, several of them. Yes. And begin to try and get the whole board to understand. That was my uh, frustration with them. They really didn't know that they didn't know. 
I, at one point several years ago when, uh, oh, who was this nice guy who was supposed to be an organizer who left recently, retired. Who, oh, Miguel? Yeah, Miguel. Um, when they first hired him, I uh, basically said he's not a trained organizer. He can't do the job that you're giving him to do. Uh, uh, Ramona called a meeting. Uh, I had <laughs> I had an attorney who was on the board who represented me in my position, but they didn't ever. Uh, you know, they dismissed it and they stood behind their employee. I, I understand where they're coming from, but that's sort of their mindset. You know, they're attorneys. They want to control the board. They want to control the organization. So you have to begin to help to educate them and see if that will make any difference. I don't know. I think the attorneys will always prevail. But Okay, so um, Paloma and then Marla. Uh, well, first I wanted to say, um, Sharon, thank you so much for the presentation. It's really, it was really nice. Even though I was a little bit late, I was able to see how well you put it together. And I thought it was very engaging as usual. And I wanted to say that I do think that um, the, professional, the professional class uh, problem is not just in organizing, but it's also in like what you're dealing with in the boards and like like what Chris was just mentioning, building upon what Chris just say, it's like building like people getting out of their professional line of, of like just seeing things. Like lawyers are going to be lawyers, but at the same time, it's interesting because you can almost I can almost see that being fought with the same tools because a lot of that class is all about education, right? And like constantly learning things, supposedly uh supposedly so so i can also see that like a history of organizing or just having like be, even before showing jane's techniques because i think jane is very concrete with the way that she talks about uh really organizing on the ground and talking to people not treating people like idiots like p treating people like equals and in a way that you're not being told by the professional class what to do. The other thing that I was, so I will want to see more of a history of organizing to ease into it. Because I do think that there needs to be like some sort of way in which people start understanding the value of this. Like I would love to have like at some point like a history of Chris organizing or Michelle's organizing or more of what you and Dick and Sharon have been doing. Okay. Like, I would love to see that. Like, that would be an amazing, we don't even have to go that far. We already have great organizers in this chapter. So I, I do think that would be something that will benefit us a lot. And the last thing that I would say is, um, do give yourself some credit because it's not easy to be in a, in, for a long time in a group and not like lose yourselves. And like, I feel like Dick, uh, Dick and Sharon have, and, and obviously Michelle and, and and Chris, like being here longer, uh, and I, I don't want to discredit everybody else who also has been here for a longer time, but as well, uh, but like being able to push on the things that you've been wanting to push, that hasn't been easy, and you have been able to. So I don't think you should forget that. You should be constantly remember that you are making progress and that you have a larger vision. So I think it's important that you keep sharing that vision with us so we, we can help you the best we can. Okay, thank you, Paloma. Marla? You know, Chris said that, that uh, part of, uh, you know, being in, in the ACLU is having access to the ACLU, un I guess the union lawyers, um, the staff lawyers, but I have had absolutely the opposite experience. In fact, um, I had, as part of, the reason I joined the Economic Justice Committee, because apparently you have to be on at least one committee to be on the SoCal board. The reason I joined the Economic Justice Committee, well, there are two reasons. One, because it's interesting material, but two, because Sharon and Dick are running it. And because I have a feeling that that being the case, something will actually get done. Um, but as part of that, I emailed, uh, I had a situation in Pasadena that is absolutely picture perfect for the part of the campaign that stands for excess uh, uh, court fees and whatnot. So I emailed that to Jess Ferris. Um, I didn't get any response at all. She just ignored it. And I re-emailed it, you know, thinking maybe she just didn't see it. 
And it was at the next board meeting and I felt, and you know, maybe I'm just an egomaniac, it's entirely possible, but I felt like this comment was directed straight at me when someone on the board or the board president said, you are not to contact staff members about anything basically. And I was like, well, okay. So you really don't want our input, do you, you know? <laughs> right. And I thought, well, wow, that's some, I guess you just drew the line, didn't you? So again, what is the point of this board? I don't know. And, and I've been to several meetings. I went to their, to their convenings and all these meetings and everything. They're all the same. Yeah. And it's just hours of blathering on with PowerPoints. And, and I still don't know, even after all these board meetings, I still have no idea what the hell the board is supposed to do. Nobody, you know, we go to this new board member meeting for hours on end. The only good part was getting fed. And, you know, it was just hours of bullshit, frankly. It was just bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. And nobody's saying, what is it we're supposed to do? Because, frankly, I don't think that the staff has a clue what the board is supposed to do. And I, I think they would rather just sideline us. Okay. Jim? Jim, you're muted. Um, okay. So, for a number of years, mm -hmm. I've worked with staff members at the ACLU. We've sort of been, you know, like I worked with LV, LV on Constitution Day. I worked with Miguel. They have been very accessible to me. So I don't understand this email saying, and Jess Ferris, I've been worked with Jess Ferris. I don't understand the email that says, you are not to contact staff members because I was always in contact with them. They were in contact with me. So I think we should somehow get this rectified. All of a sudden, what is, where is the big change suddenly that we can't work with staff members? We, I, mm -hmm. We're a team of people working together, volunteer and, and, and staff members. It, it wasn't an email that that message was said. It was actually said verbally at a, at a, a board meeting. And I, okay. I was so shocked and I thought, well, okay, what are we supposed to do then? Just sit here quietly like good little board members, keep our mouths shut and you guys do your thing and we'll just tell you how great you are every couple months we'll just get on a call and praise the dear leader for 10 or 20 minutes and tell you how awesome you are i'm tired of that i want to do not talk i'm tired of talking about talking about talking about talking about what someone else has done or will do let's do something well what do you think is there some value in staying on the board maybe you don't get what you came in for but maybe there's some other reason for you as a member of our board and an attorney to be a member of that board, mm -hmm. what what would that be? I, I'd like to turn. So I'd like to clarify what happened with this uh, uh, objectionable order to route all conversation with staff through the, the president and then go to Hector. Mm -hmm. how, that, how that came about was that uh, a bunch of us, including Paul, Jim, Vinny, me, Sharon, uh, Steve Rohde, <laughs> and others were involved in a in a in a oh. Assange uh, webinar at UCLA. No, the UCLA thing it wasn't yeah, a right. Yeah. It's a live presentation, <laughs> kind of at the last minute. I encouraged all these everybody to to contact ACLU to help promote it. So Hector and other staff got fourteen different messages and urges. And, and they blew a gasket over that. So it wasn't really a, a directed at Marla. No, not I'm not saying that I approve of this approach that they've taken. I, I also wanna say, Jim is absolutely right. The way you get around that is you, you, you form a relationship with individual staff members. Chris talks about Mohammed. Mm -hmm. she, doesn't, she doesn't need to go around the bend to talk to Mohammed. Mm -hmm. We don't need to talk, go around the bend to talk to uh, Clarissa. Mm -hmm. I don't know happened with Jess Ferris. Jess is really very accessible. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe that was a one-off because yeah. if you form a relationship with her, you can communicate with her directly. I she never responded at all. So. Again, in, in, in defense of the staff, I mean, they're trying to work at home. I mean, and they got kids, you know, you got to give them a little slack here. Well, this was six months ago. This was before any stay-at-home orders, and she just didn't answer at all. And I think there may have been some, some confusion because it may have been around the time that there was that tension with what you just mentioned. And maybe that was, you know, when, when somebody on staff said, hey, don't talk to the board members or something. But 
I just thought, well, if, as part of the Economic Justice Committee, this was the picture perfect case for excessive court fines, and why wouldn't we talk about it? Um, and I don't think that that comment was necessarily directed right at me, but it was very clear that, you know, staff did not want any intervention or, or what they see apparently as interference. And, and, yeah. and Chris is right, Muhammad's great. All I'm yeah. saying is, is the message was actually directed at me. I think there is another level of stuff going on too. Uh, a typical nonprofit, you're supposed the board members of that nonprofit are supposed to act through uh, the executive director, and then the executive director uh, brings on the staff or individual staff members. So on occasion. They kind of, uh, the affiliate kind of invokes that uh, approach to things. But you also have Clarissa, who was staffed to the uh, Economic Justice Committee, who was supposed to be a liaison to the rest of the staff. Uh, if you can't get to the rest of the staff, she's supposed to at least help you with that. And then as a chapter member, uh, we're supposed to also have uh, Gabby Rojas uh, available to us to kind of cut through and talk to staff members, especially especially the lawyers, uh, because they purport to be more busy than the rest of the staff. So uh, there's all this, all these ways that they have of communicating. Uh, at some point, they were somewhat more clear. Now they're pretty muddled, and I think that part of what that uh, forum might cover is how uh, economic justice or somebody else actually uh, gets to uh, talk about, um, you know, gets access to the staff to do what, et cetera, et cetera. But I think that Jim has uh, the best idea, uh, and Chris, and you know, those of us who are doing work that they're interested in, uh, we've been able to get the uh, uh, the people in, in Orange County to come up to Pasadena and talk about homelessness before the city council. But it took a little while. It had to be uh, something that was really urgent. Uh, and it's a, a it's not a perfect scenario, and we've got to figure out how to make it better. There used to be a uh, committee, and I don't know if it still exists, uh, that was supposed to deal with chapter board kinds of uh, concerns. I don't see them on, well, this isn't the, the, the thing that the org chart is not for the board, it's for uh, the staff. But uh, if that still exists, that might be another mechanism for us to just kind of raise, well, how do we deal with uh, working within this structure? So I just, I put this chart up because I want, want people to see, and, and I mentioned it, that the board talks to Hector, right? <laughs> but we have on the left, the activist and engagement development, which is managed by, um, um, why yeah. don't know, why is her name always a problem? Yeah. No. Is it Clarissa? Elvia, Elvia, Elvia. Elvia, uh, Mesa. Yeah. Elvia Mesa. So Elvia is Gabby's boss. But all of our communication comes through Gabby for as a chapter, how, for chapter work. But for committee work, that's outside of this. Once you're in the same committee, so I'm in the committee with Clarissa. Mm -hmm. I have direct communication with Clarissa. Mm -hmm. Jess, her Jess's area of responsibility is mm -hmm. um, criminal justice. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a criminal justice committee, then you're in communication with Jess and, and so on. Just depends on what your committee is. So when in the committee structure, which is not shown here on this chart, but in the committee structure, that's where you have your con communi direct communication with a staff member. Mm. Okay. I a question or a comment? Sure. Okay. 
a little different from what the recent conversation has been about. I wanted to get back to uh, how you can have grassroots organizing that's successful and long term. And that gets down to independent funding. So you are not dependent on anybody but your membership and probably you have to have uh, foundation support also. But you wouldn't, that makes a difference. You know, if you really want people at the bottom to have a say so, they have to begin to help fund and uh, uh, create a stable basis for their organization to exercise power. That's difficult, 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 but it has happened. It has happened. So the kind of change that I want, I, and I hope I'm not jumping in front of anybody. Does anybody else want to say anything? The, the kind I of thing. Okay, Michelle. Uh, it's Michelle. I just wanted to say that at one point, we were talking about the possibility of having uh, an ACU, a Friends of ACLU, whatever organization, uh, because it was so difficult to work within the structure that, and we were also being precluded from raising money and all the rest of that. I think that that's something else that we should talk about at some point uh, during this conversation. Absolutely, I think so too. Because I, I, I was gonna say, Michelle, I think that we can start working on doing the kind of organizing that Jane McAlevey is talking about just with the Pasadena Foothills chapter. But we do need some funding mechanism. And that's where what you're talking about, Michelle, Friends of ACLU, maybe we can raise, we can establish our own separate Friends of ACLU just to have a little extra money to do things. You know, maybe we, we why, why would the board allow that? Why would the executive director allow that using ACLU's name to raise money they have no control over? So not use the ACLU's name. Okay. It could be just us putting all our money in a pot, making our own. Yeah, well, uh, it can't be friends of ACLU. That's my okay, own. So, so yeah. we, can, we can call it something else. But we might need to do significant organizing that's going to require money separate from the ACLU. And as far as I'm concerned, the political stuff that I need to do, I tried, you know, through the Democratic Party, I was an elected representative on the Progressive Caucus of the state of California. I have been, I was really engaged with the Democratic Party. Change is not gonna happen there. The kind of things that we need done are not gonna happen with these status quo organizations. So I'm gonna join another organization and, and, I'm, and Paloma is, probably knows that it's this DSA, um, the Democratic Socialist um, uh, Party or organization. But I think we just need to acknowledge that the stuff we see happening in this country, if we don't do something soon, it is fracturing to the point of breaking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would agree. I'm, uh, who was it brought, I guess Bob was bringing up the number of unemployed. That's a worrisome thing uh, for the development of authoritarian government, which we're, <laughs> you know, got a leader that looks like he's headed that mm. way. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, Paul. Uh, another thing is uh, we haven't seen the worst of it. There, there's some real fractures in our uh, food system. You know, we've seen what's happened in the meat industry. What, what happens uh, with the, uh, you know, harvesting vegetables and, and fruit, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, if uh, one, you know, um, uh, a lot of workers get uh, uh, COVID, mm -hmm. or if the, uh, Trump decides to uh, uh, stop uh, H H two H two A visas, and mm -hmm. or Mexico decides uh, it's not going to allow uh, its citizens to come to uh -huh. this hotbed of uh, uh, COVID virus. You know, I mean that's going to be uh, a real threat to our food system. Right now we're able to get uh, fruit and vegetables in the market, uh, but uh, that, that could uh, collapse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're, we're very close to, I think that we're, we're in a much more fragile state than we realize. Mm -hmm. I think 
things could there could be major changes mm -hmm. uh, much quicker than we know mm -hmm. and these big institutions they're not agile enough mm -hmm. they can't make change fast enough and it's going to be left to, up to us I, I think at this point, Trump has been fomenting and, and encouraging and, you know, basically prodding so many white supremacists because he wants this, he wants these demonstrations on the street. He wants them violent because he has since day one, he and Bill Barr have been salivating over the possibility of imposing martial law and absolute control over the country, fuck elections, screw everything. That's what they want. This is their wet dream. And I think that we are way closer to that than, than a lot of people understand. I mean, I think it's really just a terrifying scenario right now. And as far as like, you know, the, the food, the food distributions, you know, thing, that's, that's going to be a huge problem. I mean, I personally, I haven't eaten meat in 15 years. So the fewer animals killed, the better. I am so good with that. I have no problem with meat packing, you know, meat plants shutting down. I, I'll do it myself if I could. But, um, but as far as the produce and stuff, I mean, who's going to take those jobs? The angry, racist, white protesters with their weapons? Are they going to go pick fruit? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if we don't have people to do that, then people are going to go hungry. It's really going to suck. And I think yeah, we may have to that. volunteer, right? Yeah. <laughs> hey, I've done plenty of manual labor. I, I'll do it, you know, <laughs> but it's, it's just, it's a mess. It's a huge mess. And I don't know that, you know, obviously we don't have somebody in control in the white house that's going to convey any of these messages to people. Um, but we are so close to collapse on so many levels. It's, it's just horrifying. Well, we need to end this on a positive note. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I you do it. Ray of black, pitch black. <laughs> no, I and I actually do feel positive. You know, after I listening to Jane, I'm like, you know, we can have change. Mm -hmm. And it may not come. It's the problem is we need urgent change right now. Mm -hmm. But we still there's still room for hope. Mm, I think so. Yeah. I mean, I think we'll ultimately oust Mango Mussolini. It's just how much damage he's going to do in the meantime is the problem because they're on a slash and burn you know, destroy everything on the way out and they will, you know, there's going to be a lot to fix. Um, but I think this has galvanized. I think the good news is it, is it has galvanized the last three and a half years have, have really energized a lot of people who have been on the political sidelines for most of their lives. Yeah. And I oh, hope gosh. that the George Floyd death God. And scandal, um, you know, will encourage drive young black people to go and vote who may have been inclined to sit it out and yeah. other other people who are supportive of them well what's encouraging to me is seeing these these protests and stuff and seeing how many young white people are there and yeah so just leaving it to the black community and saying it's your problem yeah. i saw something this morning where there was a group of either amish or quakers it was unclear but they even came out and held signs and started singing and i thought this is awesome this is so nice to see white people not the ones who are breaking windows and causing problems but the real people you know actually out in solidarity and i don't remember seeing that before in you know in previous times in birmingham or selma or places like that and it's about damn time white people get off their asses you know and 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 stop just bitching. but it, it's it's interesting to recall that those were organized uh events oftentimes organized by the civil rights movement these people now uh, it's a spontaneous thing they're not organized they may not persist so it's good to see them but will it last and will it you know will there something really good come out of this questionable with trump and the white house it was different with obama it was different with johnson right and so oh uh, dick, dick has a hand up dick why don't you say something then i want to say something so, so as we wrap up, I want to thank Sharon for putting in this work. Thank everybody for attending. So in two weeks, we're going to have one of these will be our board meeting on the 13th. And then Norma Rodriguez is going to present about uh, reproductive justice on the 20th. Jim Nacella has said that he would put together one of our coffee clatches for around Constitution Day. We've had Vinny and Bob and Sharon uh, present. So the rest of us have to get off the dime and, and, and come up with topics to talk about as well. And we were talking about, I mean, uh, 
Michelle and Chris in particular have done some really good actual organizing works around. So I'm hoping that they'll want to talk about the police practices work and the surveillance work and the economic justice in Pasadena. And then the rest of us to pre uh, prepare presentations. We did not get any outsiders, even though I, I, I sent emails to all the different chapter boards, emails that I had. Um, I don't know what that says, too bad. Uh, but, but we can continue to reach out to broader audiences. That's what I had to say. And I just wanted to say a follow on <laughs> to what Chris was talking about. Um, the young people, um, Marla was talking about the, the Quakers <laughs> or the Amish and the young people that are getting involved those kinds of spontaneous uh, random um, engagements versus an organized engagement. There's a paper and I'll send it to all of you. I think it's called Twitter and Spiders or something like that. But anyway, I have it and I'll send it. But the paper talks about the social media generation, the impact that it had on the Arab Spring. The paper was written by someone who was a part of the Arab Spring. And they talk of the, the, the basic thesis is that these random acts are not lasting. Hmm. We have to have an organizational structure, a mindset that understands the nature of organizing. And that's the professionalism that Chris was talking about and that Jane McAlevey talks about. So we'll, I'll send you guys some links and we'll just uh, keep moving in this direction. But I'd like for us to pick something, like pick what Michelle is doing with the renters or what Chris is doing with police practices. And we all start using that as a test to how we can organize for change. I right, thank you guys for supporting um, the movement on 392, uh, allowing us to be a signatory to this letter uh, to our elected officials here in Pasadena. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Marla. Yeah. Where where are we now? I'm thinking we need some next steps. I know that we're about to end this, the call, but I hate ending it with just kind of hanging midair. Uh, so perhaps one of these calls should be around next steps. Okay. Marla. I think I just wanted to comment on one thing that is actually relatively positive. I think that while these demonstrations, protests, whatever you want to call them in the streets may not be long lasting, they may not be organized. I think that the number of white people showing up scares the hell out of the Republicans because I think, you know, before this has all been limited to, oh, it's just those black people. We don't have to worry about them. But now they're seeing how angry white people are too. That's their voters. That scares the hell out of them and it should. You know, and, and so I think in that respect, even though they're not organized, they may not show again, uh, you know, Mango Mussolini and his enablers can't sit back and say, ah, it's just, you know, the blacks or whatever it is he likes to call people, whatever derogatory term he comes up with. This time it's not, it's the whites and it's a lot of people who are pissed as hell. And I, they can't put that genie back in the bottle and I think they realize they're losing control, so. Well, it's not often you see people lynched right there in front of you so yeah 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 and well, I think one, one, it's one comment on uh next steps it might be worth uh trying to think how to follow through with some education of at least some of the aclu board members maybe starting with the educate uh, what is it economic uh, Justice. Economic Justice, Justice Committee, is that it? Uh, with the McElhaney, uh, McElhaney, um, you know, presentation that you did. I don't yeah. know if that's yeah. possible, but that might be, yes. might help. As Go a matter, ahead. yes, as a matter of fact, Chris, there are some people who I will not name that are on that committee that have expressed the same kind of frustration that Marla and you and I have expressed. Also on the foundation, uh, side of the ACLU. There's a tremendous amount of frustration. But let me say that it, it's more than just a few people. The people who have set, joined up for the Economic Justice Committee with a fair amount of enthusiasm mm -hmm. are looking for just the kind of thing we're talking about. Mm -hmm. They're already doing that kind of work in different venues and they'd like to bring it together here. So I think we'd have a very receptive audience. Yeah, yeah I do too. Why can't you? I, we could do it 
like we're doing today online. You don't have to go downtown to the office and get permission and stuff like that. Just pitch it to the people you think are going to be interested and do it. Yeah. So, you know, we had, we've had a couple of Zoom meetings online, just like this, with the Economic Justice Committee. If you guys are interested, please join us. Yeah, and when, when you had the last forum, the whole board was invited, uh, as well as the chapter uh, leaders. So uh, that is a mechanism that can be used again uh, just around organizing that piece of the, uh, the pie. Okay, that's great, Michelle. Thank you, Chris and Michelle. I think that's what I'll do. I'll polish up this and, and present it to them. And right. then we'll talk about doing it to the wider organization. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Thank you. And I'm ready. I would like to do something on rent, on the rent control uh, effort to let the chapter understand better exactly how intricate it is and driving me crazy. But <laughs> yeah, I think that given the fact that the chapter is so supportive, it needs to probably understand better what we're undertaking. Okay. So pick a Saturday, the 13th and the 20th of June are taken, and the rest are wide open. Jim hasn't said when he wants to do Constitution Day. Okay. I'd like to see us do something next Saturday. Yeah. I'm, I'm uh, I don't want to drop some of the uh, initiative that this particular meeting uh, stressed. Let's, let's stay with it. And Jim, Michelle, my, my feeling is that our what we have to offer is the brain power of the people who are uh, doing this talking and, and the experience. Those things are, are priceless. Well, next week will probably be a little early for me, but uh, in a couple of weeks, I will have enough stuff so that I can, uh, we, we need to be making presentations anyway. And it's just, we're just not there yet. We could have a short one hour meeting just to kind of touch base and see if there's any news to talk. What about asking people uh, on the economic, the board's economic justice committee to uh, join us in a fuller discussion yeah. of McAlevey's um, position? Um, and ask them about what they, you know, what's, uh, what they see as possible and not. In other words, find out what they ask them to talk about their frustrations of the, of the limitations of working with the board. I don't know whether people would come to that, um, but it's an idea to get them involved early on seeing that they're not alone, that there might be a way to change things at the board somewhat. I, I don't know. What do you guys think? What do you think? I think, I think, I think it's a great idea. Um, and I already know exactly who I'm going to ask. Um, Marla there has be a fo follow on, in other words, that Bob yeah. is suggesting, you know, an hour or something like that. Yeah, no, I think it's a great idea. Marla? I could probably put together a presentation for next Saturday if anyone's interested in constitutional law and civil rights abuses by animal control, because wow. animal control makes LAPD look like, you know, Mother Teresa. Yes. You got it. 10 o'clock next Saturday. Okay. Okay. I, can, I can throw something together quickly because it's something I know intimately. And please do. So we'll and will you talk you about down. and will you also include asset forfeiture? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's definitely asset forfeiture. It's highway robbery. They'll steal anything they can steal from you. Well, the other thing is help us help us get more people in. All of us help us. I'm an up. introvert. I don't know people. <laughs> <laughs> well, bring those dogs then. <laughs> My dogs, they'll be here. I can bring them all in here with the cat. They'll be happy. They're sick of me though. <laughs> So, uh, Marla, if you could send us a title of it and a, and a three-sentence description sometime early in the week, and I'll, okay. I'll ask about the others in case we can get a bigger audience. Yeah, it, animals tend to bring people in. Yeah. yeah. And you can say something like a couple of lines of, did you know that, blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah. Because mm -hmm. a lot of people probably don't know. They have no idea until they get caught up in the system. Yeah. I, I even did an interview for uh, PBS for a... Uh, uh, 
or is it SoCal Connected? Because one of their producers had gotten caught up in the, in the dangerous dog system with uh, LA Animal Control. And they contacted me and said, do you want to talk about it? I said, are you kidding? Give me a microphone <laughs> and a camera. You won't shut me up when it talks about, you know, to talking about animal control abuses. Good. So in, in the background, in my background behind where I'm not sitting at the moment, you probably saw our cat taking a poop in her box. So she'll, <laughs> they, she'll need, they need to know that. <laughs> you know what, Dick? My, my entire life is scatological. I have dogs, you know? It's like, you cannot, when I passed the bar, I'll never forget. I was so excited. I was jumping around and, you know, I was all thrilled and running around and I was going to celebrate with some friends and I took my dog out for a walk. She took a poo and she was like, I don't care what you just did. You're picking that up. And I went, okay. <laughs> I will always keep my feet on the ground. I know my role. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. On that, I, I, I think we'll end you guys. Okay. But I just wanted to say, Dick looks great with that hair. I, yeah, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> keep it. Keep it. Don't cut it. It's the mad <laughs> scientist look. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> All right. Bye, everyone. You need to close the meeting. It's still going.